Welcome, everyone. We're very excited uh, to have you all here and really, really uh, honored to have Adela Cedillo with us today um, presenting on this uh, second to last session of the Cat Center for Mexican Studies um, after a, a hiatus that we had for, for a couple of weeks. So it's good to see everyone back. Um, Adela Cedillo, as many of you may know, she's uh, assistant professor of history at the University of Houston. She did her PhD close to here, right, at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So she's also a Midwesterner, like the people uh, that joined this university. And she's the author of several articles and books from which I can mention here. El Fuego y el Silencio, Historia de las Fuerzas de Liberación Nacional Mexicanas, 1969 to 1974. She's the co-editor of Challenging Authoritarianism in Mexico, Revolutionary Struggles and the Dirty War, 1964 to 1982. So I'll keep it short just so we have more time for the presentation and the Q&A. Um, again, thank you very much for joining us, Professor Cedillo, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much to the CAT Center for Mexican Studies for the invitation. And Juan, Camilo, thank you. Um, so I have like around 40 minutes, right? Yeah, around 30, 40 minutes, however long you, you want to take. Uh, the more you talk, the less time we have for Q&A, of course, but, yeah. but whatever you need to develop your, your argument. Yeah, okay. So you, you can see my slides, right? Um, yes, perfectly. Okay, so uh, well, uh, this period <laughs> that you uh, asked me to talk about, well, this is very complex because it entails several conflicts during that in, in which the army was the protagonist. Yeah. Um, so I, I will try uh, to be very like um, to summarize a, a great deal of information in 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 a few like ideas and arguments and. Uh, well, uh, as I expected, uh, Tom Brad um, had explained many of these things in his presentation, but you told me that he only, uh, was unable because unfortunately he had COVID on that day. I hope that, um, that he feels better now. Um, so, uh, well, as you may know, well, probably everybody knows that the PRI, the, the, the ruling party that controlled Mexico, for all the decades of the, the Cold War, uh, calling the armed, the armed forces to fight against the political enemies uh, of the regime to both the, the left and the right wings. And uh, like enemies like, uh, especially the, since the 60s, from the uh, 50s and 60s, the military suppressed small revolts in the countryside uh, in several states. Uh, other revolts were more known, well known, like um, revolts led by military military revolts or or in, civil ins, insurgencies, which is a different uh, type than an armed revolt. Uh, but for instance, that was the case of the Miguel Enriquez, and um, which was uh, the contender for the 1952 elections. Other were splinter groups of the Enriquista movement, like Celestino Gasca, who led the Federacionistas Leales. Uh, and these revolts, of course, were suppressed by the military. Also, there were major uh, peasant revolts, like the one that protagonized Ruben Jaramillo in the state of Morelos. Uh, so all these uh, civic and armed revolts were, were suppressed by the military. And the military also uh, intervened to disarticulate peaceful movements, all sorts of movements uh, during this era, student movements, movements by teachers, unionists, professionals, and so on. So in the, what is very peculiar about the decades I, I'm going to focus on, the 60s and 70s onward, um, the, there were the, 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 um, two, new, two new challenges emerged. On the first hand, uh, the socialist armed movement, and the other hand, a flourishing drug industry. So the government used the military as the first line of defense against these alleged enemies of the nation, which were called also called the internal enemies, and later on, national security forces, national security threats. So this was part of the Plan D in two, intended to thwart internal conflicts. The Plan D and uh, D and one, as far as I know, uh, which is the the, the plan to uh, face a foreign invasion, has never been activated uh, during this period. 
So in, in 1965, the government also created the aid plan for civil population, known as, as the plan D, uh, DN3E, to respond to national to natural disasters like floods, floods, um, earthquakes, and so on. And probably this is one of the plans that the military is better known for. Uh, however, the military has been more active regarding the plan D in two as we will see. So from the DS or DAS administration uh, uh, in the 60s and mid 60s to early uh, 70s, uh, well, 1970, uh, rumors about the military coup were very persistent, but the military always reassured its loyalty, this loyalty to the regime and its institutions. In exchange, the ruling party granted the military all sorts of privilege, privileges, benefits, and perks. So from the post-revolutionary period, period to present day, uh, the military has been an institution characterized for its capacity, unchecked power, corruption, and lack of, of accountability for, it, uh, for the misdeeds of officers and soldiers, regardless of the severity of their actions, which include uh, war, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, so this is um, what happened during the Cold War years in a nutshell. And we will go to the up to the 21st century, but I, I will uh, delve into that later. So let's start here in this region in which northwestern Mexico, in which the dirty war and the and the war on drugs intersected uh, in a very powerful way because uh, this region, well, this is the northwestern, especially this region that in which uh, the uh, Sierra Madre Oriental, the highlands, uh, Sierra Madre Occidental, sorry. Uh, in which uh, that covers parts of the states of Chihuahua, Sonora, Sinaloa, and Durango, occurred the simultaneous emergence of the uh, Grupo Popular Guerrillero, the Popular Guerrilla Group, which was the first Mexican socialist guerrilla movement in history, in the Mexican history. And also at the same time, there was a, bo a boom of the drug industry as a result of the interruption of the French connection uh, that had to do with the uh, uh, smuggling of heroin from uh, France to the United States. So Mexican heroin had more demand in the US market. So the Golden Triangle, that is a region that is uh, between uh, the highlands of Sinaloa, Durango, and Chihuahua, the, all these regions, especially this region from Badiraguato, Guadalupe, Calvo, Guanacevi, and Choice, uh, all this region, right? Uh, Urique. So all those municipalities, um, the, those are the municipalities that confirm the Golden Triangle. So there's a Golden Triangle inside the Golden Quadrilateral, which is the name uh, as, as this region is known. And is the largest production and the largest region of uh, production of opium poppy. And uh, it has been the largest produ producer of poppy since from the, between the uh, 1930s and the 1980s. Um, so in this, what the, well, the military reacted to, to, well, the government actually reacted to, to these uh, challenges, well, by waging, staging uh, two different types of wars. On the one hand, the, the dirty war, on the other hand, the so-called war on drugs. And the, let me start with the dirty war. <laughs> so um, the PRI, uh, of course, uh, aimed at destroying the revolutionary left in which is known as, as this period that um, this conflict that actually never received a name. I don't know how many cases in history are like this, but this conflict had no name. Officially, the conflict did not exist. There was not a war, but actually it was a war. A war that was not launched by a dictatorship, but by an allegedly democratic, democratic populist government and a symmetrical and irregular warfare in a specific uh, region, cities and regions of the countryside. A war that violated the rule of law and the Geneva Convention regarding humanitarian treatment in times of war. A war that produced thousands of unaccounted victims of extrajudicial killing, torture, rape, unlawful imprisonment, forced disappearance, and forced displacement. A war that was covered up and did not receive inter any international attention. A war that remained unnamed for decades until writers, journalists, and scholars in the 1990s began to refer to it as a dirty war. And even the, the same survivors also call it the dirty war, um, the, the guerrilla, the former guerrillas. So according uh, to the historical report of the special prosecutor office that was, cre was created during the Vicente Fox administration, which was the first uh, non-PRI uh, administration, um, 
so the according to this report, this office uh, and the report of this office that was is known as the FEMOS report, the military was responsible for up to 80% of the human rights abuses during this conflict. So um, there's no doubt, even though the DF, the National Security Directorate, is more famous, you know, for its atrocities and, and the, the kidnappings and torture, actually the military uh, was more active and perpetrated most of the atrocities. Um, so the dirty war began in, in the highlands of the Sierra Madre um, Occidental in 1964 with the first counterinsurgency campaign against the popular guerrilla group. For the very first time, the Mexican military had to intervene uh, it, by, uh, to, 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 co to combat this, this type of, of, of uh, guerrilla uh, the guerrilla forces, not that the military was not used to like well, fighting uh, uh, guerrilla groups, but this, this guerrilla group was very specific. It's a guerrilla group that emerged from a popular movement, uh, an agrarianist movement, uh, was highly, ideolo highly ideological, uh, and uh, there, there was a risk that in the military view that this uh, small group would um, convince the whole population to join their cause. So, that, so that, that's why the counterinsurgency campaign was very extended. And um, on the 23rd of September um, in, uh, of 1965, the popular guerrilla group assaulted the military barracks of the town of Madera, Chihuahua. And uh, there were multiple losses of sites, especially on the sites of the on the side of the guerrillas. And this first campaign was characterized by the attack on civilian population. Uh, torture, they even tortured kids, senior people, uh, and most of them were, were peasant population. And uh, there were also flags of, uh, that were surveying the region. Uh, so it, it was a, there was a massive uh, uh, like search for the, the surviving guerrillas. And the, this uh, picture is, uh, well, uh, these are the corpses of the guerrillas who died uh, on that day. And their corpses were uh, thrown to a mass grave. They were the families were not allowed to to uh, to bury their own dead. So this is one of the um, like the uh, uh, type of repression that began to totally disrespect the the most, most basic rituals, um, the religious rituals and even you know family rituals. So this type of repression since the very beginning was uh, they started very very um, high. Um, with very high, high standards of violence. And the conflict, well, that's that for, is, I think it's a conflict that has been very protected um, because it lasted for, for almost two, most of two decades. Uh, it has a slow motion ending from uh, 1982 with the end of the Lopez um, Portillo administration and uh, to the beginning of the, well, the, the first years of the, the La Madrid administration in 1985. And the, the way in which the conflict ended well was because the government accomplished to eradicate, to exterminate the guerrilla movements. And also because of the, the La Madrid administration dissolved the national security, the, the federal security directorate and its terrorist structure because of their involvement in the drug industry. The DFS had become a sort of um, organization that protected the Guadalajara cartel. And I will uh, talk about this later. So even though the DFS was dissolved, um, the people who were disappeared during this period was never presented. There was zero accountability for the gross human rights abuses of the dirty war. There was no agenda of truth, truth and justice or anything similar, uh, which is completely different to what happened at the same time in Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. Um, another key moment of the participation of the military in this, uh, in the, in, 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 as the repressive uh, branch of the, the PRI, was, was a massacre, the Tlatelolco massacre, which, massacre, which is very well known. I, I won't explain what was, this was about, but um, oddly enough, it, it stands as the most uh, remembered episode of the Mexican Cold War. The dirty war has been forgotten. The war on drugs, people don't have, except for the Northwestern region and Guerrero, people have no idea about that the, there was a war on drugs in the 70s. But everybody remembers Tlatelolco um, because it was very public. It was very, there were thousands of witness, witnesses 
and um, and the repression was uh, was not justified. I mean, the military employed counterinsurgency tactics to uh, toward a peaceful movement. Um, so Tlatelolco remained as a symbol of um, um, well, a, a, an atrocity that in which the military should have been accountable because they never explained to the society how many people were killed or where where are the you know the, the the bodies of the people who were killed. So there were many rumors about what happened with the dead, and um, but um, well, it would it would be very long to explain. So I will leave it that. There were two years later another massacre in which the military. Um, Echeverria decided that he wouldn't use the military directly. He was very clever in a very twisted way. So he created, or he he or, uh, um, gave orders to create this um, this group, the so the so called ho the Hawks, when he was secretary of uh, the interior in the, during the Diaz Ordaz administration. But during his when he became a president, president. Uh, this group, the Hawks, was received a lot of resources, funding to to expand the group, to have received training, you know, in in all sorts of um, street uh, street guerrilla fighting. Uh, so this group, the Hawks, uh, was completely organized by the military and the office of the mayor of Mexico City, uh, and they orchestrated the Corpus Christi massacre, which is well very well known. It's, it's, uh, it's known as the Alconazo. And uh, around 50 or, or, or to 70 people were killed, but the corpses were disappeared. Many of the, most of the victims were, um, the, we don't know what happened to them, like in the Tlatelolco massacre. So the military, uh, they, the, the way they, in which this, this group operated and the information that was given to the public opinion completely like erase uh, or, or um, covered the press, the, like that the military, the fact that the military was behind this massacre too. Mm -hmm. So this massacre didn't affect the image of the military as much as the Tlatelolco massacre, but of course that the military were ultimately responsible for, for these two. And so the Mexican government uh, used a rhetoric of um, the inter, the, this rhetoric, the, the that they, they are both the armed and non-armed groups were part of an international cons communist uh, conspiracy to take power uh, in all countries and also in Mexico. So uh, the government um, built a discourse of le uh, leg uh, to legitimize itself by claiming that uh, what the government was doing was saving the country from terrorists supported by socialist countries like the USSR, Cuba, North Korea. Actually, there was a guerrilla group that was training in North Korea, the, the Revolutionary Action Movement. And the, the government used this in a very powerful way to convey the message that to unify the society in, 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 in a fight against these foreign uh, enemies that have infiltrated the nation. And of course, the military well was a very the, the, the ones who were expected to fight against these external enemies. Of, of course, this was not framed as part of the plan D, DN1. It was part of the plan DN2, but still uh, the discourse, I mean, as you can see, there's no correspondence between the discourse and the military strategy, uh, but uh, that's what was how it was presented. It was a strategy of psychology, an operation of psychological warfare to convince the society that they should join the fight against these uh, traitors of the nation, which is what traición a la patria means. So from the, after the assault of the Madera barracks, there were uh, many, many guerrilla groups that emerged throughout the country, in the countryside and in, in the main cities. I have counted around 42 different organizations uh, in in all the Mex most of the Mexican states, there were very few states in which the guerrillas had no presence at all, and most of these guerrilla groups were connected to either peasant movements, civil movements, or um, student movements. So these are um, in response to this challenge, which uh, in if the if we re read the documents uh, by the National Security the, the Secretariat of National Defense and the, 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 the Federal Security Directorate, they convey this sense of like 
uh, threat. They feel actually that uh, the emergence of all these groups in different parts of the, the country was very problematic, not because they have uh, like firepower or they were about to take power, no, no, no because, but the, the risk that the, the national security apparatus saw was that these groups could, would create an alliance and take power. So as long as they remain disorganized and, and separated, and, and that was uh, that was important, like for um, like to prevent that they join that all these forces like fighting uh, in different parts of the country uh, join together. So that's why I think is this explains why the dirty war was so radical in the extermination of even the smallest groups with very little firepower, because the guerrilla groups they they obtain their weapons from uh, well, the black market, they, uh, some of them traveled here, here to the United States, to the border to, to, to purchase weapons and so on and so forth. But they were like, they were mostly students and peasants with no previous military experience, right? However, they were exterminated with tactics as if they were the worst, the most severe threat in the world which makes this, this conflict very outrageous because most of the people who were attacked were not even combatants. They were, it was civil population. Most of the victims were civilians. So I won't, uh, well, you can see here the tactics. I cannot read all of them. I will only mention some of the most uh, outstanding, for instance, well, the extrajudicial killing of guerrilla leaders. This is a counterinsurgency strategy, kill the leaders and the, the movement is gonna be beheaded. Uh, which it resembles the, the kingpin strategy that the later it was used against the drug uh, cartels, like the, the focus on the, the like uh, killing the leaders to disorganize the whole organization, disturb the whole organization. So, um, well, that was a, a major tactic, the scorched earth policy and forced starvation of the peasant population to prevent them from feeding the guerrillas, the bombing uh, or defoliation uh, of the forest where the guerrillas were hiding, hiding <clears throat> the secret executions of, well, the disappearance of people like in, in a very random way. Some people were detained and presented to the, to the, to the, to a, to a judge. Other people uh, were di uh, disappeared for no apparent reason. Uh, so there were a, uh, all these, the people that were disappeared, the so-called detained disappear, they uh, were uh, secretly executed um, and they were victims of the dead flights, which is a practice of tossing the, their bodies into the ocean, um, especially the, the, the Pacific Ocean from um, the military planes. Um, and there were also, uh, Part of the counterinsurgency that was not um, that doesn't entail, did not entail violence, which were the civic action programs to win the hearts and minds of people, and this is a very these civic action programs along as uh, with the psychological warfare help to create a positive image of the military and, and the well the national security apparatus, despite all the abuses all the atrocities that they were committing. Uh, because they were uh, giving people food, they were creating, you know, infrastructure, uh, they resolved the little demands that people have for many years, like, oh, I want, they want a new school or, or they want uh, drinkable water. So the, 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 the government, especially the military, started to resolve these little demands uh, to win the hearts and minds of people. Um, so the military units um, systematically involved in the counterinsurgency campaign were the Parachute Fusiliers Brigade, the military police, and the infantry battalions of all these military zones that I have listed here. Also, uh, the, the Navy participated, especially in Guerrero, the, 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 the personnel at the Icacos Nav Nav Naval Base, um, and the Air Force also participated um, because the, the military uh, planes were used to transport all the prisoners from different states to Mexico City to the military camp number one. So the, for this purpose, it was used the Mexican Air Force, uh, Air Force Base number one in Santa Lucia, the state of Mexico. Now Santa Lucia uh, has been split, uh, like split into the 
civil airport that was built by the military in this administration, but also all these counterinsurgency facilities that uh, were used for many, many years, you know, to, for these purposes. And so I think it's outrageous that there, there has no accountability for what happened in Santa Lucia. Anyway, and the other Air Force was the, the Air Force Base Number no. Seven, in which from which the the, the Pia de la Cuesta Guerrero, from which most people were tossed into, most of the disappeared allegedly were uh, tossed into the ocean. Um, so these are pictures of the uh, the Parachute Fusiliers Brigade. We can recognize them because of the type of backpack they use, and the military police. Well, they have the PM in their um, um, cascos. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, the dirty war entailed the use of um, paramilitary groups like the White Brigade, which was a group created in 1976, uh, proposed by the then uh, DFS chief Miguel Nazararo. And this is the group that finally uh, exterminated the surviving guerrilla movements in the late um, 70s and the early 80s. And it was created, um, the way in which the brigade operated, there was a lot of internecine, internecine strife between the different agencies, police and military agencies. So the idea of the, the white brigade was that the, these police and military agencies would cooperate and would divide the benefits. You know, when they, when they ass assaulted a uh, guerrilla safety house, or usually there were millions because in that in the house is storing the house because they, that's how the guerrilla what the guerrillas did they kidnapped people they assaulted banks <laughs> sorry so there was a lure these, these agents were lured by you know uh, by the money that they, they could find in the safety houses that's why they, everybody wanted to arrive first and they fight for the um, for the for for everything that was inside the house, they even kept the houses. That when the guerrillas owned the houses, then the, the the Brigada Blanca agents kept the houses for themselves as as private property. Once that they kill or disappear the the, the guerrillas, uh, so this plunder was a uh, the way in which this different fighting and fighting was sold was well by uh, distributing that sharing the wealth that of this plunder. And it was a very clever solution because it worked. Um, but also the, the White Brigade benefited and uh, profited from the extortion of drug traffickers. So there is no official account of the victims of the Dirty War, uh, but this estimated that at least 3,000 people were killed or disappeared, most of them from the states of Guerrero and Sinaloa. There were thousands of cases of torture. Most of the people who were tortured were civilians because they were either relatives, um, neighbors, co-workers of the guerrillas, not because they were involved in the armed struggle at all. Uh, there was hundreds of unreported cases of rape, um, or probably thousands, uh, also hundreds of or thousands of victims of the so-called death flights. We, we have no idea how many people was killed in this way. They were hundreds or maybe thousands of victims of forced displacement, and some of them became unofficial refugees in the United States. Many, many people migrated to the United States during the dirty war years, and they are invisible. Nobody has written anything about them. And that would be a great research topic indeed. There were also dozens or maybe hundreds of devastated peasant communities and thousands of families that have endured the consequences of this conflict even to present day. They are still searching for their, their beloved ones. They, they still want to know what happened 50 years later. So the Dirty War is a key episode to understand the continuity of political violence and the trend of strengthening of the military power in 20th century Mexico. Uh, the conflict also marked the modernization of the armed forces to adapt them to a framework that followed the doctrines of national security and counterinsurgency. So during this period, the Mexican armed forces received support of the United States armed forces in the form of military training. More than 1,000 um, military officers, Mexican officers were trained in, in, in US um, military academias or even the School of the Americas. Um, the United States also sold weapons, uh, weaponry and supplies to the Mexican military. However, uh, the U.S. intervention in this conflict was very limited if we, when we compare it to what happened in regions like Central America. 
Uh, so I wouldn't say, I don't think that the United States play a key, a key role in the Mexican dirty war, which would be like something peculiar in the Latin American context of dirty wars and internal armed conflicts. So the dirty war also explains, uh, the, out, the outcome of the dirty war also explained uh, the second guerrilla wave in the 1990s, as I will see in, 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 in some minutes. I will explain in some minutes. And explain is also this conflict also, also helps to explain the overlapping of the, the dirty war with the war on drugs and the regional dynamics of the current war on drugs, because the current war of, of, on drugs have uh, followed so many trends that were established during these years of the, the dirty war years. So there's there is no statute of limitations of war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, that the military clearly perpetrated during these years. So the dirty war, dirty war crimes is still and, and should be prosecuted, even though most of the military officers who committed these atrocities, well, they they already they have passed away, unfortunately. But there are some of them that are still alive, even though they are very very old. They are in the nineties, and they cannot go to prison. But I would still, uh, I think, if there is still a chance at these people to to be prosecuted, right? Um, at the same time that the dirty war was happening, uh, there was um, a simultaneous conflict, the war on drugs, that, uh, well, in Mexico, um, since the 1984, uh, the military has been involved in anti-drug campaigns. Here we can see the timeline of these counter narcotic campaigns. Ha um, and what is very interesting is how these two conflicts intersected and became kind of the same conflict with two different enemies. Uh, but the, the military, as I will explain, used the, the very same strategies. And for instance, in the 19, in 1975, in the context of Operation Canador, which is an acronym for, for Cannabis Adormidera, Adormidera Poppy, um, uh, there was created the plan TechPan, which is a plan that explicitly combined uh, the persecution of drug traffickers with the persecution of guerrillas. Is is the language is is, is very explicit. Um, but the most important operations, what I deem as the first war on drugs, are Operation Three Zone and Operation Condor from 1976 to 1988. Uh, this operation, well, I I, I will touch upon that in a second, but I, I want to um, emphasize that the military has been active in these counter-narcotics uh, campaigns from 1948 to uh, present. The present to the present, even though the present conflict has no name, it's like the dirty war. We don't have a name for the present war because the government uh, is reluctant to call it a war, even though it's clearly a low intensity war. Um, so we have the same problem that, 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 that the people have in the, in the 70s that nobody is naming this conflict. Uh, contrary to what happened with um, Calderon and Peña Nieto, that they somehow, yeah, they, they talk about a, a war on drugs or a, a fight. Well, how to, Calderon, uh, I mean, Peña Nieto called it a different way, like... Uh, like the, I don't even remember, but it was something like the, 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 the I, 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 no, I don't remember, but yeah, it, 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 it um, like, it, it eluded this language of war, but it, it was a war, like, regardless of. So, um, in the, in, since 1969, with Operation um, uh, Canada, marijuana and opium poppy became a military target. So of course, this operation responded to well the U.S. pressure. Nixon uh, established Operation Intercept in 1969 to force the Mexican government to strengthen their their anti-drug policy. So that's what, how the Mexican government ended up adopting a military military strategy uh, to to fight against the drug producers. Um, so in the 1960s and uh, I mean since 1969 and onward, there was a the the um, the Mexican government accepted the the, the American uh, proposal to militarize the anti drug strategy, but also they um, to with the idea, you know, you know that they are going to destroy the source of the pro of the, of, of of production uh, of poppy and marijuana, which is known as a source control model. But um, 
the Mexican government also had in mind the that they would use this conflict, this this uh, the resources provided by the DA that was founded in 1975, in a way that um, they could use this strategy, the the war on drugs, to have more political control in regions in which the, the, there was a clearly lack of state presence or in which the state uh, institutions were were very very weak. Uh, like the highlands of most of the highland regions in, in Mexico, the Sierra Madre Occidental, the Sierra Madre Oriental, the Sierra Madre del Sur. Mexico well, has plenty of mountain ranges. So um, the war on drugs was used to expand the peer, the presence of the military in all these regions, um, facilitated by, you know, the American resources in the way of um, more resources in, in like, like um, helicopters and weaponry, but also money. So the operations tree zone and condor uh, targeted massively the rural population of the so-called golden quadrilateral and, and the golden triangle, imposing a de facto stage of, of siege in the region. Um, there was a, an aerial defoliation program oversaw by the DA and the, the Attorney General of Mexico, and also a military a manual eradication campaign laid by the, 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 Secret, the Secretariat of National Defense. So this operation, especially Condor, had this dual command. Um, and uh, in 1970, in the last year of the uh, Cheveria administration, the, the guy who was in charge the, of this anti-drug campaign was uh, Alejandro Gersmanero, which is uh, the Mexican attorney in present day. And uh, he was, of course, responsible for the organization of these campaigns. Um, so the Mexican... But the, the military also wanted to have a major intervention in the campaign, so they, they, they there was a kind of um, tension between the the the, the, the Sedena, the Secretary of National Defense, and the and the Attorney General of Mexico. So the the the, the military accomplished to have its own role in the in the program uh, through the first task condor, without the overseeing of the P, the PGR. So the commanders that participated, uh, well, so the, the military had uh, law enforcement functions in the highlands, even though these functions were not contemplated at all in the constitution. And the commanders that participated in the counterinsurgency campaigns in Guerrero, especially the state of Guerrero, they were uh, appointed as commanders of the force task condor. So the operation, um, actually it was not really to like put an end to the drug industry. What they did was that they forced out of business small drug growers and traffickers and, and a few drug lords like Pedro Aviles, which is a very emblematic case. He was killed by uh, the military in a military ambush. But uh, what happened at the same time, they uh, allowed the most powerful drug lords uh, to survive and to escape with the help of the DFS. So the, the Federal Security Directorate uh, sought protection to, a, to this group of, of, of Sinaloa and drug lords. They sent them to Guadalajara, the state of the city of Guadalajara in Jalisco, and they formed the Guadalajara Cartel, which is, was the very first uh, organized criminal organization that, that was more organized, um, better organized in terms of a structure and, and outreach. And because they bribe several um, uh, agencies, police and military agencies uh, in, across the country. So it, it was very like a, a, a network of, of criminals that was very well organized. Um, even though there are conflicting accounts about uh, the Guadalajara cartel, but in my opinion, for what I have studied and seen, yeah, they, they were very well organized. Um, so the... Uh, one one minor fact: um, there was a military officer, um, Guaracha, Luis Guaracha, who um, he was. Uh, he protested um, to the high command because uh, he realized that the White Brigade were protecting this this drug lord Pedro Aviles, 
So there were very few military men who officers who were um, who voiced their concerns against this complicity between uh, state agents and, and rugglers. Uh, so which means that not everyone in the military was agreed with what there was happening. So there were so many actors and so many interests. So I don't want to convey the, the idea that all the military was corrupted, all the military officers were involved in the drug business or but there were certainly officers like Waracha that were against it. But um, I think that the trend is that Operation Condor enabled the military, many military officers, especially those who participated in counterinsurgency, to become involved in the drug industry, as we will see. So Operation Condor um, is very similar to what happened in, in the dirty war against the revolutionary groups the same, exactly the same tactics, uh, plus uh, the fact that thousands of people were displaced more, even more than when, when that is the first displacement in Guerrero during the Dirty War, because uh, communities in the highlands were indiscriminately targeted in, in four states, Sonora, Chihuahua, Sinaloa, and Durango. So many of these people, well, they, 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 were, um, they moved to either the United States or to the cities. And um, this war was even more cover up than the, the dirty war, because at least the dirty war, there was psychological um, campaigns, you know, about presenting the guerrillas as terrorists, or as evil people, people who were mentally disturbed, as President Chavarria said. But in the case of the war on drugs, this, this was completely hidden from the public opinion. There were very few articles, very few, in, very little interest on, on what, what was going on in, in the highlands of the Golden Quadrilateral. And also Guerrero, because Guerrero, it also, the war on drugs was also very important during the 70s. But of course, the, the, the focal point was the, the, the Golden Quadrilateral. So uh, the, some of the consequences of this conflict were a, well, here, a long lasting de facto state of siege, a shared sovereignty between the military and drug lords and the Golden Quadrilateral, the decentralization of the drug industry and the cockroach effect, the narco client, the, the, the formation of a narco clientist regime uh, that benefited the Guadalajara cartel and a counterinsurgency um, payoff system. So, the, mm, this is the legacy of the first uh, war on drugs. Um, I will. I think I will stop soon because I haven't no, realized that I have talked for almost forty minutes. But um, what I want to emphasize is that um, the these of the some of the trends of the the first war on drugs um, became like a structural in a way that during the second war on drugs in in two thousand six there were also the same. Um, the same patterns, like for instance, the failure of the militarization of the counter narcotics strategy, the impunity and corruption by agencies in charge of national security, the dual sovereignty share between uh, criminals and state agents in several regions of the country, the reintroduction of forced labor, uh, that which is something that the Guadalajara Carte did, uh, the war on drugs as a smoke, a smoke, a smoke screen against armed and social movements, which also happened during the, the, the first years of the second war on drugs, systematic human rights abuses uh, that were neither investigated nor punished. So all this happened in the 70s, and all this is happening since 2006 to present day with the second war on drugs. So I will only mention, well, I cannot, I won't explain these slides. I will go um, to key points in uh, what happened later with the um, counterinsurgency in the 90s, this conflict is also important, even though I don't have time to explain what happened here. But um, the counterinsurgency uh, against these two groups, the National, the Zapatist Army of National Liberation and the Popular Revolutionary Army, uh, strengthened the military to the extent in which the um, several of the, the groups that participated in these uh, counterinsurgency campaigns, like the for Special Force Corps, force, uh, yeah, the Special Force Corps, um, they became later on defectors and joined the, 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 the Gulf Cartel and other cartels. So that's one of the reasons because the, the drug cartels are so extremely violent is because they many of the people who, who belong to these cartels, they, 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 they were people who were trained in military schools, 
war schools here in Mexico and the United States and even other countries. So the violence that we get to see since 2006 to present day is not random violence by like deranged people. No, 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 it's, 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 it's a violence that comes from these counterinsurgency campaigns by people who receive training in these practices, people who be, used to belong to the military. So, um, well, the, 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 definitely the second war on drugs is more violent and is worse than everything we have seen before. But um, there's no doubt that this is a, a business that is so profitable. There's no interest, real interest, neither in Mexico nor in the United States to put an end to this conflict because there are so many like the 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 money that they like the like the the tons of the, like millions and billions of dollars that that these illegal businesses render every year and um, make impossible um uh, for like a true like to stop um all these illegal structures um so we can clearly see a pattern in which there are more militarization and more organized crimes organization. So these are my final slides, my final slide, uh, the conclusions um, that I, I will end up with this. The administrations, uh, the, the PRI administrations who use the armed forces and as an instrument to strengthen its hegemony and extend its political control over regions with scarce institutional presence. Uh, and all the administrations, post-PRI administrations, have done exactly the same. There is no difference, in my humble opinion. The political parties um, in office uh, have offered the military all sorts of privileges and perks in exchange for loyalty. Uh, since the 1970s, many high-ranking officers have used these benefits to partake in criminal activities, especially in the drug industry. And uh, in many regions, there's there's this uh, uh, shared sovereignty between corrupt state institutions and criminal organizations uh, who have established a de facto state of siege with um, ruling with total contempt for the rule of law. Rule of law. The militarization of both national security and public security has been a long lasting trend that in my opinion has never been interrupted. There is a sort of, no, sort of nostalgia that I don't know where it comes from. Like, oh, now the public security is militarized. Like, wait a second, when, in which period over the past 50 years was something any anyhow different? I don't see it. So um, the armed forces had, they succeeded in destroying the guerrilla movements. However, they have allowed criminal organizations to follow this pattern of systematic fragmentation fragment in which small groups are either engulfed or destroyed by larger criminal organizations. And the winners in these fights buy protection from military and police agencies. And this is a, a vicious cycle that, that has been repeating for many decades, at least since Operation Condor. So mili the militarization of the anti-drug strategy has been uh, not has been not only a historical failure but also a farce, a farce that unfortunately had entailed a high toll. So the, from the post-revolutionary period to the present, the armed forces have perpetrated systematic war crimes and crimes against against humanity with total immunity. Very few soldiers have been brought to either military or civil courts in the past twenty years, and during the PRI era, no one, not a single person, was ever prosecuted for these crimes. The structural alliance between state officials, military officers, police agents, and criminals have weakened institutions and the capacity of the Mexican society to respond to challenges like violence, insecurity, corruption, and non-democratic elections. And the military is a cornerstone of this failed regime. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Adela, for that very brutal in its information but fascinating talk very concentrated but i think you touched on on a lot of very important points given that we have so little time for questions i'm gonna try to take them in groups of three so maybe we can have hopefully two rounds so I'll let camilo start if there's other two questions i'll pick them immediately otherwise we'll just keep keep talking camilo You're muted. Can anyone hear Camilo? I, I can't hear you, Camilo. 
I think maybe the headphones are affecting. Uh, yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I have a question about um, institutional capacity of the army. Um, basically, I'm, I'm thinking from the Guacamaya leaks and all of that, and it strikes me, maybe it's an naive uh, perception that the contemporary army is, is, is quite stupid in some things, that it, um, that it has some poor intelligence. What, what's your take on, on that? And uh, does that change between the, the 1960s and the 1980s? Throughout the, the dirty war, is, 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 do you perceive that the army gets more intelligent and more capable of understanding the real threats, the real risk? And, um, and, and related to that, but if it's too much, we can leave it aside. Um, is, is there any meaningful um, campaign of um, infrastructural development in this, uh, in the Sierras, in Sinaloa, and Guerrero? Is, is there like actual, you know, building of schools, building of sewers, building of power facilities? Or is it just window dressing to you know keep 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 cultivators happy for for a few weeks and uh, and keep going with with everything? But yeah, what what's the institutional capacity of the army in these years? I'll let you answer right away if you want because I don't see any questions right right now. So what people think about it? I'll... Sure. Um, oh, well. Uh, Someone who is an expert in, in military affairs uh, told me that uh, the second section in the military, which is in charge of intelligence, actually did a better job in surveillance and um, intelligence than the DFS. Um, but I don't have a. I, I have read like hundreds, thousands of military reports, and um, and some of them coming from the second section. And I I don't think that the military really have ever have these. Um, high expertise on uh, intelligence and surveillance. What I can, if, I mean, if we read this, this book by uh, Costa Chaparro, the Mo Movimiento Subversivo in Mexico, Subversive Mo Movement in Mexico, we can realize how, like, um, how, how inefficient the intelligence was. I mean, without torture, torture was the only mechanism to extract information. So what would they do without torture? Nothing, because they don't have the tools. They don't have the training. They, they, they just uh, go brutally to torture whomever to, to have information. So I, I would say that this is a structural failure of the intelligence, the military intelligence system comes from the fact that the military, the Mexican military has never have dealt with a, a major threat. They have harassed most 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 of the people they have harassed or tortured, killed, etc., are civilians. So where is the challenge? Of, <laughs> I mean, they they are not uh, doing their job in a professional way. They 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 go straight forward to attack civil populations. So, so what's the need of having a better intelligence system? There's no incentive, right? And your second question, I didn't I didn't get, got it quite well. Oh, you you are mute again. Sorry again. Uh, my second question was about uh, whether there was any real institutional capacity to build in, um, infrastructural systems that, that you mentioned in the towns of, of Guerrero and Sinaloa. Uh, you talked about uh, building sewage, building schools. Was there any real increase in the sort of like uh, infrastructural side of the state in these regions? Um, or, 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 or was it, you know, paltry, very weak, uh, build, you know, two classrooms, not even be able to pay a teacher and then just move on? I think there was a, um, there was, a, the, 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 mil, the, the government did build infrastructure in the, in these regions uh, after, well, when these conflicts uh, happened. There were more schools. There were more investment. For instance, the expansion of the institutes, the National Indigenous Institute, was huge in this region, especially well in the Golden Triangle. Um, so yeah, there there was an um, institutional capacity to to expand some institutions, but uh, once that the threats were put down. The, the state disappeared. <laughs> there was no more investment, no more resources for these projects. So it's very in the PRI style. We pretend that we will something and we, yeah, we create some uh, high roads and so on and so forth, but 
Later on, we forget about it. Once the threat is over, we forget about it. That was the trend, I would say. Professor Panzers. All right. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Adele, for your uh, long and fascinating talk. I have uh, just one comment on the connection of your last uh, comment. You didn't mention anything about Michoacan, but of course, we know from some of Salvador Maldonado's work that some of the things that you talked about actually are starting in the in the early 1960s, eh? the social work and the and the combination of uh, political intervention, military and, and drugs. I have two questions. The first is, uh, you didn't say anything about sources. And I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in, in, in knowing, tell us a little bit, if, if this is basically coming from a lot of your work in the DFS uh, uh, archives, or if you also have been able to access the Sedena stuff itself in the Sedena, that's one thing. And the other thing is probably more speculative, but nevertheless, from my point of view, interesting. You have looked so much at this material for several years now. Can you tell me a little bit about what your expectations are about the current AMLO founded committee that is operating and looking at the dirty war? Uh, what, what, what would you as a, I consider you as an expert on, on the dirty war, particularly in the Sinaloa area and so on, but what do you expect from that? What do you think that we can still learn and find uh, that we that we don't know, you don't know yet? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful questions. Uh, yeah, Michoacan actually, well, I have so many things I, I could mention, but um, the governor that started Operation Condor in, in Michoacan was uh, Gautemo Cárdenas in 1980. So, of course, uh, the Operation Condor, yeah, like um, in, uh, beyond the, the Golden Quadrilateral was um, very important in district states, Michoacán, Guerrero, and, and, and Oaxaca. Oaxaca was the largest product marijuana, indeed, during those years, even more than Guerrero. Although the Golden, the, the, the Gold Acapulco was better known, but Oaxaca produced more, more marijuana. Um, regarding the sources, yeah, it's, it's um, Mostly, most, most of my research is based on the DFS and the Sedena reports. Oddly enough, with this administration, we have we, have, we can see uh, like the complete experience, uh, like files, because they now they they allowed us. There's no more censorship, but this has the process of getting to these files is so difficult. So um, the, there's like uh, no. It, incentive you know to go to the archive is is, is a, a very complicated process but most of the, my research happened before the 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 AMLO administration so I was uh, very lucky to collect all these sources I worked for, for in the DFS archive I mean as a researcher for many many years since 2002 to 2012 so I collected a lot of information that I I didn't know that it would be helpful for my future research so I'm glad I did that. And also the Sedena, the Sedena files that are in, in the same national, national archive. Yeah, I also had a chance to, um, to work with hundreds of files. Um, but yeah, those are my, my two main sources. Well, and the EPS, the IPS, uh, which is the other branch of the Secretariat of Interior that, um, the Secretary of Interior that, that, that also dealt with intelligence. Uh, so these three archives, I this yeah, I, I regularly explore them for many many years, um, and that's how I came to the conclusion that the dirty war and the, the war on drugs were like kind of the same war by looking at the everyday reports by these agencies that 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 that, that gave me an idea on how to work on these on these intersections. The other question about the Truth Commission. Yeah, you, uh, to prepare for this presentation, actually, I was reading the FEMOS report, and I realized that even though it's so poorly written, it's a method, methodologically speaking, it's a disaster, it's still a very relevant report uh, in terms of that nobody, not even uh, individual researchers, have done something that is uh, so complete and, and so in terms of all the regions that the, the report um, is uh, touches upon and all the, the different conflicts, the different social movements. And, and so I don't think that the present Truth Commission can, can 
show us something new. I would be very, very surprised if they come up with something new because um, not because everything has been said, no, 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 but because they have focused on, I mean, at least their public activities on interviewing the same people that researchers and the FEMOS interviewed 20, for the past 20 years. They are doing exactly the same job, the same type of work that we have done before. So I, every time that they they have these public events, I wonder what, what or they, every time they there are um, in the newspapers they, there are news about the, what they are alleged findings. I think well, we already know these. The famous already show this information. So what, what are they doing? I mean, where is the novelty of? So far, I haven't. I mean, I think it's a merit that the victims, a group of victims, not all the victims, actually there's the largest groups of victims which are in Guerrero are against this Truth Commission because they don't feel represented. The Truth Commission represents more uh, the groups that are in the cities. Uh, so many people from the countryside feel completely neglected. Uh, but the, these groups of, of victims that are legitimizing the, the commission um, is because they um, kind of sympathize with the current administration. So I think that's very problematic because we have a very politicized, a very divided commission. Uh, the, the, the people who are supporting the, the AMLO administration, including the victims against the people that what, what was left behind, including me. I mean, I have never been asked for my expertise as uh, to contribute with my expertise to any of uh, any work for the, the Truth Commission. So I think, and, and other experts, not only my, my case, other experts have, they have told me, no, nobody has contacted me, you know, for anything related to the Truth Commission. So I wonder like, well, they are not taking into account some experts. They are interviewing the same people. They are doing the same work that other commissions have done before. So what what, what is going to be new about this? So my expect, expectations extre are extremely low. And also, I think that the main problem here, because I also work with the, the legal aspect of it representing um, families, is that the, 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 uh, the, the uh, attorney, uh, the federal attorney, office, the, the FAA, the EFGR, has no interest at all in these files. They have completely overlooked all these files. They, there's no research, there's no law enforcement is doing anything at, at all. So we have a, a, it's something that in Spanish is called inactividad proces, procesal, which means that uh, the, the, the prosecutors are doing are not doing anything at all with these files nothing there's no advance nothing nothing like but what can, can we expect when Gers Manera was appointed as the as the, the attorney of Mexico so that is for me in my opinion that's a force um, and well I think that's that was where all the questions we have time for we, more yeah with, without yeah with authoritarian I'm going to use the the authoritarian powers of the of the moderator and given that the debate is always some of the most interesting I mean it's all interesting but a lot of things come out in the in the debate uh, I I think we would benefit a lot from having both Ana Maria Serna and Thomas Rath uh, ask their questions oh and I think there's also something in the chat from from uh, Nathan Ellis Strand that we can that we can add after this this other two two questions. Professor Serna. Thank you, thank you, Juan. I, I I was about to to ask about censorship, and you you let me speak, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Adela. Uh, I I'm wondering. I'm doing a research project on militarization and censorship and the, the role of journalists. So what is your, what have you found about this? Is there a correlation between the violence against the journalists and the, the role of the military in these processes that you have spoken about? Is there, is there a, have you found a direct censorship from the military against uh, journalists. I, 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 I might not agree with you that there has not been interest in this. I, I, I think that there has been a lot and there's a lot of remaining memories you know, around the, all these places that you have researched. 
but and, and probably local journalists that have been killed or have been threatened or whatever. Have you come across something that that you could help me with or that you could guide me? Maybe we can talk someday, I hope. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this is more or less what I'm wondering about. Thank you. Do we answer now? Yeah, you can. You can answer. Yeah, answer, answer it, and then I'll I'll, I'll give the, the the table to Professor Thomas Rath to to ask his question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely in the places like Sinaloa during the state of siege um, in the seventies. The military uh, was involved in uh, the killing of uh, journalists. Uh, there was a, a very famous case. I can send you the, the information. Is even though it's part of my current book, I forgot the name of the journalist. But it was a very famous case uh, that even mobilized the public opinion um, to to solve this crime, um, because uh, is is there I. You know, Mexico is, is a very strange place. Uh, only very few cases when a journalist is killed, very, in very few cases, there's a public reaction. Most journalists are killed and, and nothing happens, but there are very few cases um, in which, um, yeah, there's a national uproar uh, to protest these killings. And this happened in the context of Operation Condor. And, um, but it was not the only case. There, there were other cases in which, because of course, journalists were, if but every time they investigate corruption, uh, these alliances between organized crime and state agents, they're, they're always military personnel involved. Always, I mean, the military. Oof, uh, the, the the history of the, the 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 these connections between the military and the underworld is is so uh, so long lasting, and um and the journalists are the ones who have the. I mean the 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 people who have exposed these connections, and that's why they they got killed since the sixties and seventies, especially in the seventies. But yeah, I, I I found several cases of of um this way of censorship, but um, but the only case that I have studied in detail is in Sinaloa. But I know that there there are, I mean I think if we if we study we look at other regions yeah we will find more for instance Guerrero um, in the seventies also there was a great deal of censorship there was I mean I would say that in every state in which the military took control of the institutions and everything of the national security apparatus and everything um, we can find that the 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 leading institution in censorship was the military but in other places. Um, it was the secretary, the secretary of interior, that uh, the, the, the gov that organized all this uh, psychological warfare and censorship and made, made media control and everything. So yeah, but yeah, I can send you what I have from Sinaloa. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Rath. Hi everybody. Um, it's nice to see you all. Um, um, Adela, fantastic paper. I really enjoyed it and. Um, Professor Stoner, your project sounds amazing as well. Sounds really, really timely and interesting. Two quick, quick questions. One, I'm just interested about the the photo of the the the, the corpses that you showed early on from '64 or '65, and uh, you use that to talk about sort of, I guess, the beginning of disappearances. So I just wondered, where does that photo come from, and who made it, and for what purpose? Is that just for internal files, or was that published, or you know, what? Tell us a bit more about that photo. And the second thing is, I guess, you know, this may be a, this is just a, a, something I've been thinking about myself quite a bit more. So I just thought I'd ask you about it. I mean, one of the things that's happening in the hierarchy of the military at the end of the 60s and early 70s is that there's a kind of generational turnover where the last of the old revolutionary veterans essentially die off or are finally retired. And so, and then they're replaced by sort of officers who've been trained uh, after the revolution. So there's a sociological, what looks like a fairly significant, potentially significant kind of sociological change. And I just wondered if, if, you, if you'd found any evidence that that sort of really makes any difference one way or the other in terms of how the military is perceived or talked about or what it does. Because uh, it strikes to me that one way or the other, it would be interesting. If it makes a difference, that would be interesting. If it doesn't make a difference, that's also quite interesting given that there is this clear sociological shift. No? So um, that's the question, and yeah, thanks very much for a great paper. 
Thank you, Tom. I hope you feel better from COVID. Um, so, well, even though that happened a while ago, but um, so yeah, I will answer first your second question because when I was looking at the files uh, the, the, in the, 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 I also have uh, work on the archive of the Senate. So they have, uh, because of the promotions, all the promo military promotions must, must be approved by, by the Senate. So the, the Senate in the archive compiled all the files of these uh, military officers. And uh, so I was very impressed that many of these officers were uh, like Acosta Chaparro, elite officers, not uh, all random, because some random officers, well, they come from poor, humble origins, but more elite officers like Acosta Chaparro, Quiro Sermosillo, they come from military families. They are, their parents, their, uh, their fathers participated in the Mexican Revolution. So there's a military tradition. Uh, of of, um, of many of these counterinsurgency of officers, so I, I think that um, this new generation that uh, staged the dirty war, they are like in between, you know, these uh, old practices or all these old traditions uh, that um, were in place during the Mexican Revolution, but with this modern mindset of counterinsurgency and and the national security doctrine. They embrace anti-communism, so they ideologically they are fairly distinct, but they kept this national this discourse of defense of the homeland, and so it's a very interesting generation because yeah they 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 share the you know the new and the the old and the new they combine threads of the old and the new uh, military uh, yeah the armed forces. So regarding the, the, the picture that I show of the courses of the guerrillas that were killed during the, the, assault, of the, the assault of the military, the, Madera, the, the military barracks in the town of Madera, this is a picture that comes from, the, well, local journalists were the ones who took those pictures. Uh, and these pictures were, were shown by the, for the very first time in a book that um, actually worked as psychological propaganda against the guerrillas, that the book in, in Spanish, the name is Que Poca Madera which is um, a pun, you know, it's, it means that they, in Spanish, it would be translated as these people have no mother or something like that. But it's playing with the word madera, madera, madre, mother. Um, so this, um, this was the best, the very first book ever written about a Mexican guerrilla group, Que Poca Madera. Um, in response to uh, another book, actually it was the second, because it was a response to the book by Jose Santos Valdez, which is a book that tried to explain from a more sociological perspective why his former students rose up against the government. And the, the Jose uh, Valdez book, I think the name is Madera, Razón de un Martirologio. And the book, uh, but the book with the pictures is Que Poca Madera. And there's, a, I'm sorry, Juan, no, no, no. there's a question. Oh, thank you, Bill. Bill uh, reminded me that the, the name of the journalist killed was Roberto Martinez Montenegro. Thank you so much. I, I don't know why I, I, I blink with that the name. And uh, there's a question about Nathan in the, in the chat that I would like to reply to very quickly because he says that Mexico is currently in its third drug war. And I think that's totally right, uh, that the new conflict that we are um, seeing today is an evolution, a new stage in these cycles of never-ending violence that started uh, during the Cold War. So definitely, it's a, uh, we can understand the patterns of what happened up to 2000, from 2006 to, to well, from the Operation Condor to uh, 2018 with the official end of the war on drugs. But what is going now is so hard to come to understand. Is is uh, like it is still falling to these old patterns, but there's something new. Definitely, I think that within some years we will be speaking about a third drug war, for sure. Well, it is time right now, but thank you very much again, all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much to Professor Cedillo, Professor Pancers, Professor Rath, Professor Serna, everyone who contributed with her to, to Nathan Edelstrand. Thank you very much for everyone who, who uh, joined us with comments, questions, and Given what, what Professor Cedillo said about sort of news reporters being key to this, I hope to see many of you uh, when Jesus Esquivel next week talks a bit about um, 
the 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 very contemporary evolution of this of of, of this uh, military and drug connection. So yeah, thank you all, and and hope you have a great great week. <laughs>